Hi, I'm Stanley Sherman. I'm an evangelist in the Church of Christ, and I'm dedicating this video to my grandson, Joseph, who was baptized this last Sunday evening, December 25th, 2016. And so, Joseph, I'm going to talk to you just like you're sitting across the table from me here, and um, I want to review with you what you did and, and talk to you about what lies ahead in the future now that you're a Christian. First of all, from your teaching, from your parents, and from listening to sermons, and from reading the Bible, you established a faith in Jesus Christ, and that faith changed your heart. You wanted, uh, you began yearning to want to be a Christian, to be a part of Christ's family, a part of Christ. And so this faith that changed your heart led you to want to change your life, or at least the direction of your life. And so that's repentance. Repentance is when we decide we're going to quit living a, a life that we design for ourselves, a life sometimes that goes into sin and folly. And we want to dedicate our life now to follow Jesus and be a part of him. And so that is repentance. Repentance is a change of life. And so repent, uh, faith changed your heart. Repentance changed your life. And then baptism changed your relationship when you came to the fulfillment of your faith in coming to Christ by being baptized into his death. And that's where you contact the blood of Christ, as the Bible teaches. And that washed away your past sins, and it brought you into the family of God. And so now you're a Christian, a Christ one. And being a Christian doesn't mean that you're automatically going to have a smooth life. It can be uh, sometimes some difficulties, setbacks. Satan's going to try to tempt you. Uh, Marvin Phillips one time wrote a book called You Can't Get to Heaven in a Straight Line. There's hills and valleys and things, but Jesus helps us through all this, and he helps us to stay faithful to him. And so we want to learn some things today that is going to help you, guide you as you start your life as a Christian. Peter, in First uh, Peter, his first epistle, First Peter, addressed new Christians and he said to them, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Just like you need food to sustain your physical body, so you need to feed yourself on the word of God to build and uh, sustain your spirit and keep it healthy. And in his second uh, epistle, his second book, he tells how you grow once you come into Christ. Once your faith has brought you to Christ, he says there's some things that you need to add to your faith now. And he says if you do these things, you'll never fall, but you'll have that entrance into the abundant life in heaven at the end of your life. And so he says here in 2 Peter chapter 1 to add to your faith virtue. Virtue means moral courage, the courage to have good morals, the ability to determine right from wrong and to decide, should I do this or should I not do this? And in growing up, I always had this uh, little formula in mind. If there was something that uh, some of my friends wanted me to do, I would ask myself, is this something Jesus would do? Do I want to be found doing this when Jesus comes again? Is this what I would want my own child to do? And so when you ask yourself some of these questions, it helps you to determine and discern between what's right and what's wrong. And then, of course, as you grow in your uh, knowledge of the Bible, these things will be much easier to discern. So add to your faith virtue, moral courage, the courage to stand up for what you believe as well. And add to virtue knowledge, knowledge of God's word. The Bible is so important to us. And so um, it's important that we start reading the scriptures. It's a good habit to try to read the Bible through in a year, reading three chapters a day in weekdays, five chapters on Sunday. You can read the entire Bible through in a little less than a year. In fact, if you read the New Testament 30 minutes a day, you can read the entire New Testament through in a month. What if you read the New Testament through 12 times this next year by adding another uh, 30 minutes to maybe the 15 minutes you give on reading the Bible through. So 
it's important this first year to really get yourself established in the world, add to your, in the word, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. And then the knowledge, temperance, temperance and self-control. And that's when uh, it not only involves to controlling your temper, but your demeanor, how, how you relate to other people. Uh, people know that you're in charge of yourself. In other words, it's in charge of your life. You don't let other people tell you what to do other than, of course, your parents, but you make sure that what, you're, what people want you to do or what they say you should do matches what God wants you to do because all kinds of people are going to try to be influencing you and saying, Joseph, hey, you need to look at this or let's try this or whatever, or you need to rethink this. Always use the Bible as your standard. So add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience. Patience means that you don't act suddenly on things, that you hold off, you let go and let God. Uh, there's problems that you're going to have that you can turn over to God. You might, there may be a problem that you're uh, facing that's going to take a little time to work out in your life, whatever that might be. So uh, patience helps you to uh, wait on the Lord and ask Him for His help and then uh, do what you can and leave the rest for God to do. Add to your patience, add, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, and to patience godliness. Godliness is trying to be godlike in the way, try, try to think of things just like we said a while ago, what would Jesus do? Think of things in terms of being a godly person. You want to be as close to God as you can. And this involves worship. And when you come to worship, you need to focus on God. Um, if we had a lot of time later on, maybe I could explain to you more about uh, how to do effective worship where uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, it talks about Isaiah that uh, he saw God high and lifted up. And then he compared himself to God and saw, well, hey, I have a lot of weaknesses. I'm a frail person. I need to repent. I need to always have this attitude of repentance, wanting my life to be closer to God. And then he realized that God forgave him. And so uh, there was a challenge that God gave. Uh, Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So this is the purpose of worship. We come to pour forth before God our, our thanksgiving and uh, the thankfulness for how he blessed us during the week and uh, adore him, as his greatness, praise him. And then this refuels us and helps us to be strong as we leave the worship and go through the week. So there's many things that uh, we can talk about later along that line that will help you. So godliness, and godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness means that you're going to relate well to your brothers and sisters in Christ because now you're part of the family of God. And so you have an extended family, a spiritual family. And so you want to treat them with love. There's a word spelled joy, J-O-Y. And a good formula is associated with this word. Let Jesus be first, others second, yourself last. And that spells joy. And if you do that, you will have a joyful life. And add to brotherly kindness, charity, or love. Love like God loves. Uh, God loved us so much he's willing to lay down his life for us. And so this is a sacrificial love. It's called agape in the Greek. And it's beyond self. It's uh, something that we try to love people like God would love them. And if we do that, it's going to be easy for us to serve people and easy for us to relate to other people. Now, as a Christian, you are now a part of the family of God. You're a Christ one. Uh, the part of the body, the body is a family of God and it's called the church, of course. Jesus is the only head, so we're only going to look to him as the head of the church. There's no human being on this earth who ever had the right to start a church. Only Jesus did. And that's the, that's the church that Jesus added us to, that added you to when you were baptized. 
Now let's look at our moral character or the character of our life as we want to grow. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. Now keep in mind, you're part of the family of God. You're part of his body, the church. You're also a branch with the vine. The vine is Jesus Christ. You're a branch coming out of that vine. And as so, you're to bear fruit. And it's natural that a vine is going to try to reproduce itself. So that means you try to reproduce your, reproduce Christ in the lives of others too. So that involves uh, looking to teach others, but it also involves the fruit of the Spirit. How do we know we have the Holy Spirit in our lives? We were promised that when we were baptized. So how do we know he is there? Well, it will show in the fruit that we have in our life, our character. And so these are what's called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, uh, all these things uh, define our character now that we are in Christ. Now, not only are we a part of the uh, vine that reflects Christ, we also see that we are part of the army of Christ Jesus. That means that we're involved in warfare, and it's a spiritual warfare. And I want us to look at some of the equipment that we're supposed to have in order to be able to fight against Satan and in order to effectively carry the gospel to others. This is uh, found in Ephesians chapter 6. Let me turn there. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He didn't say put on a few pieces of armor, but our goal should be to put on the full armor of God. And he has in mind here the Roman soldier. And if you've seen a picture of the Roman soldier and all the armor that they had, so let's look at some of these things that will help us to effectively stand for God and also be aggressive. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against uh, the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of weakness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore having uh, girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming uh, missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. You know, the sword that's uh, compared here in this passage is similar to the old sword that um, the ancient swords that the Israelites used. This is a replica of one of those swords. And the Roman, the Roman army also used swords like this by the side of the soldiers. They were double-edged swords. And the Bible is described in the book of Hebrews 4.12 as being sharper than any two-edged sword. This is a two-edged sword. It has a blade on this side, has a blade on this side. It means it's capable of cutting, coming, and going. So it was used defensively. It was used aggressively. And so the sword of the spirit that we use is not a physical sword like, like this ancient sword, but it's like the uh, God's word. That's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so we wield it. And um, it cuts both ways, coming and going, uh, that aggressively to spread the gospel to others, defensively to guard us and protect us from the wiles of Satan. And he goes on to say, after all, putting on all this 
armory says and pray with and petition pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints so you see in a nutshell what it's like to be a christian and what's expected of you and so i'm looking forward to seeing your progress and helping you in every way that i possibly can and i want you to have a wonderful new year as you start your life and a brand new life a brand new year god bless you